Hi, hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Happy Juneteenth and welcome to today's Juneteenth Jubilee 2021. I am so excited to be with you today. Um, just to give you a brief rundown um, before I get into the heart of the presentation, uh, I'm gonna give a, just a few introductory remarks, probably about five to 10 minutes. And then I'm going to briefly go over the book list that my colleagues and I created. Um, that'll be about five minutes. Um, then our wonderful guest, Mr. Shamari Wills, author of Black Fortunes, will give a presentation about 40, 45 minutes. And then we'll take a three minute break. And then I have just um, five to seven questions of my own. And then we will open it up to audience questions. Um, in the chat, and you're more than welcome to submit those questions at any point throughout the program. Um, if Mr. Shamari Will so chooses, he can provide closing thoughts and his social media information. And then I'll give my concluding remarks and then we'll go home. Happy June tea. Does that sound Does that sound good to everyone? Okay. If that sounds agreeable, we will proceed. Welcome everyone to the, as I said before, welcome everyone to the Juneteenth Jubilee 2021. My name is James. I'm a program specialist here at the Dallas Public Library. And I've had the proud honor of developing Juneteenth festivities for the library for the third consecutive year. Hopefully you were all able to attend this morning's program with the wonderful Ms. Mrs. Carol Boston Weatherford. But if you didn't, that's okay because it was recorded. So we will send the, um, the recording to you, to all registrants at a later date. This afternoon, at this moment, 
We have an exciting program with the author of Black Fortunes, Mr. Shamari Bills, as I already said. But I would have I have a few announcements. I have some people that I have to thank. First, I would like to thank the friends of the Dallas Public Library for their generous support of today's program. Without them, this program would not be possible. I would also like to thank my colleagues who have helped me put this program together. Their names are Adrian, Alicia, Monique, Rotina, Jordan, and Carlos. Thank you. I would like to also thank for promotional assistance, the Tulsa City County Public Library, as well as City Manager T.C. Brognack, and one of our City of Dallas um, employee affiliation groups, Black Employee Support Team, as well as the Dallas Public Library's Employee Advisory Council. Now I will read to you the code of conduct for today's program. We want this to be an open, positive, and engaging program. To ensure a safe space for all, any derogatory or insensitive comments on the basis of race, gender, class, sexuality, religion, ability, citizenship status, or country of origin will be flagged. The person making them will be removed from the event. Thank you. The library is now open. All 30 branches were open. Isn't that exciting? You can go to our website for more details about what you can expect when you return at our website at www.dallaslibrary.org. And while you are there, go to Hoopla Digital, where Black Fortunes is available in ebook and e audiobook. I will tell you personally that I checked out the e audiobook version on Hoopla, and guess what? I completed Mr. Will's wonderful 300 page book in three days. So it is available because it, I've returned it. So check it out. This event is being recorded. So we ask that all participants keep their mics muted and video turned off. The chat is enabled, which is where you can submit your questions at any point during the program, as I previously stated. If you experience any technical issues, Please send a chat directly to us at all panelists and someone will, will work to address your issue. So now I will go give a brief um, historical overview and moderators, could you please put up the slides that were um, presented at the opening of the program just so people have a reference point for the things that I'm about to say regarding my historical overview. Thank you so much. And I will begin when that is available on the screen. Um, starting with what was June, what is Juneteenth? There we go. Thank you so much. What is Juneteenth? After the Civil War, Union General Gordon Granger delivered General Order Number no. Three in Galveston, Texas on June 19, 1865, announcing that all enslaved peoples in Texas are free. Every year, this event is celebrated as June 19. Get it? June plus 19. In 1979, Juneteenth became an official state holiday in Texas. <clears throat> Since 2016, Fort Worth native Mrs. Opal Lee started Opal's Walk from Fort Worth to Washington, D.C., to gain support from Congress for Juneteenth to finally be recognized as a federal holiday. Looks like her hard work paid off because on Thursday, June 17th, President Joseph Robinette Biden Jr. signed into law Juneteenth as a federal holiday. Isn't that amazing? Next, because our focus of this program is Black economic empowerment, please proceed to the next slide about what was the theme of saving this thing. Thank you so much. I will begin, thank you so much. The Freedmen Saving and Trust Company was a bank chartered by Congress on March 3rd, 1865 to promote financial stability for formerly enslaved African-Americans, primarily Civil War veterans. Headquartered in our nation's capital, Washington, DC, the bank had 37 branches in 17 states with assets worth $80 million when adjusted for inflation from approximately 70,000 de deposits. 
Due to fraud and mismanagement, the bank collapsed in 1874. Abolitionist leader Frederick Douglass even provided some of his own personal savings to, to, um, to, to support the bank. However, his uh, efforts failed. Most of the depositors were never reimbursed for their losses. This is, and this is the reason why, if ever you've seen Big Mama hide her cash underneath her mattress, this is why. The mistrust between the African-American community and the financial institutions of the United States continue to this day. Next slide, please. What was Tulsa Black Wall Street? To the Greenwood was an all-Black neighborhood of Tulsa, Oklahoma, annexed in 1909 after an oil, oil boom that became a safe haven for African-Americans seeing Jim Crow segregation in Southeastern states <clears throat> and seeking financial prosperity. Due to the unprecedented number of Black-owned businesses in Greenwood, the area was christened, quote, Negro Wall Street by civil rights leader Booker T. Washington. On Memorial Day, 1921, racial tensions escalated into one of the worst massacres in American history, with an estimated 300 dead, 10,000 homeless, and damages estimated in excess of $30 million when adjusted for inflation. 2021 marks the centennial of this tragic event in American history, which is why we have Mr. Wills, who discusses one of the founders of Black Wall Street, as, as well as other historical figures of Black economic empowerment in his book, Black Fortune. And we will introduce him momentarily. But first, um, I would like to show you the book list that my colleagues and I created. The book, the book list slide, please, thank you. The book list presentation, please. Thank you so much. Next slide, this, welcome, June 10, 2021. Okay, so here we have books for children. We, we um, earlier this morning, we had the wonderful Kara Boston Weatherford, who spoke about her, she primarily uh, read from Juneteenth Jamboree, but she also um, touched on her latest book, on, one of her latest books, Unspeakable, The Tulsa Race Massacre, um, a collaboration between her and Mr. Floyd Cooper. Mr. Floyd Cooper previously wrote a book, Juneteenth for Macy, and then there's a newer book, Opal Greenwood, Oasis. <laughs> I couldn't. I couldn't see the the rest of the title. Next slide, please. Okay, we have young adult novels, um, or I should say, uh, novels and nonfiction. We have Angel of Greenwood by Randy Peake. That's a, a a newly released title. We have Blackbirds in the Sky by Brandy Colbert. Now, Brandy Colbert um, previously in 2020 was a part of our uh, Women's Centennial. Um, program and she talked about um, her book was The Voting Booth, if I'm not mistaken. Um, someone can correct me if I'm wrong in the chat. Um, but she was kind enough to make a um, be in, um, in our presence with Dallas Public Library in the fall of 2020. The Burning um, is an, The Burning by Tim Madigan is originally a um, was an adult book, but he collaborated with Mrs. Hillary Beard um, to adapt it for YA. And then the next book, Searching for Sarah Rector by Tanya Bolton, Ta excuse me, Tanya Bolton is a book about um, Miss Sarah Rector, who was a young black girl in Oklahoma who benefited from the oil boom in Oklahoma. And she became a multi-million dollar, uh, a multi-million dollar fortune that she unfortunately lost in the Great Depression. But she had all of her money until the, uh, the, Great, Depression, the Great Depression. Next slide, please. Okay, what do we see? <laughs> Mr. Wills' book, Black Fortune, ta-da. Okay, the next we have um, On Her Own Ground by um, the life of Madam C.J. Walker by her um, great granddaughter, if I'm not mistaken. If someone knows otherwise, please correct me in the chat. But you may have um, noticed that um, Mrs. Alilia Bundle's book 
was um, adapted into a Netflix miniseries. And I have a question for Mr. Wills about that because I have some thoughts about uh, that Netflix series. But, but this is the original book that Mrs. Bundle uh, wrote and the Netflix series was adapted from her book. Then we have Prince of Darkness about Jeremiah Hamilton, who um, Mr. Wills briefly talked about in his book. Um, Mr. Jeremiah Hamilton was an interesting man. That's all, I'm, that's all I'm gonna say about him. And then we have Black Wall Street 100 by Hannibal Dawson, who is the lead of the 1921 Tulsa Massacre Centennial Commission. Next slide, please. Okay, then we have Tulsa 1921 by Mr. Randy Crevio. Um, Mr. Crevio is a journalist. Um, and so he researched all of the um, original reporting um, when the massacre took place. Okay, then the original Black Elite um, by Elizabeth Downing Taylor, it talks about Daniel Mary, who was Daniel Mary. He was the first, um, he was an African-American who was an assistant librarian to the library, in the Library of Congress. Why did I include him? Because we're the Dallas Public Library. <laughs> Then next, we have the strange career of William Ellis. Mr. William Ellis was an African-American um, born into slavery into Texas, but then after um, the Civil War, he moved to Mexico and then he identified as Latino and then he became a millionaire. And that book is by Mr. Carl Jacoby. So he, had, he has transracial identity. And then next, we have the a Paradise, a novel by Toni Morrison, the late great Toni Morrison. And why did I include this novel? Because this novel is about the third, the, the um, things that take place in a town in Oklahoma that was founded by former enslaved, uh, formerly enslaved individuals. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> so. The Wonderful Paradise novel by Toni Morrison. Um, that was originally published in 1997. And next slide. And we just have some additional titles and we will send this to you at a later date. Next slide. More, addition, more additional titles. And then uh, I'll just read the names of those that worked on the presentation. Mrs. Ad Mrs. Adrian Johnson, Mrs. Alicia Deal, Mr. James Glid, that's me, Mr. Jordan Bach, and Mrs. Martina Jones. Thank you so much for listening to our book list. And now, if you all are ready, I will introduce our speaker of the hour, Mr. Shamari Will. Are you all ready? I am. Can everybody hear me? So Shamari Will is a journalist author and television producer. He has worked for one Caribbean television as a reporter. CNN, where he served as a producer for Don Lemon and Good Morning America, where he won an Emmy as a producer. He is currently a contributor by News and Investopedia. He is also writing a follow-up to Black Fortunes and a young adult novel. Shamari received an undergraduate degree from Morehouse College and a graduate degree from Columbia University, where he was named a Linton Book Writing Fellow. Shamari was born and raised in Washington, D.C., and currently resides in Brooklyn, New York. Thank you so much, Mr. Shamari Will. The floor is yours. Well, thank you, James, and thank you for the wonderful intro and the wonderful um, uh, talk that you gave uh, right before me. Um, and, you know, kind of going over the broad strokes of what Greenwood and Black Wall Street was. So um, today we're here to commemorate Juneteenth. Happy Juneteenth, everybody. We're also here to talk about Tulsa and Black Wall Street and my book, Black Fortunes. And there's a theme that runs through all of those things that I really wanna um, harp on today, which is economic independence, uh, which is essentially what liberation was. Uh, you had African Americans who lost all of their human rights uh, due to enslavement, but they also lost their economic rights and even had their economic 
human rights trend uh, someone who was enslaving them and keeping them in bondage. So the emancipation from slavery was not just giving people their human rights back, but giving people their economic rights back and their labor rights back. Um, and so that is uh, an important theme for African Americans, economic independence, uh, economic empowerment, economic rights um, that inspired me to write my book, Black Fortunes. Um, I have a copy here, I'll hold it up. Um, and basically what this book is about, it's about the economic history of African Americans. So it's, it, it follows the first cohort, the first group of black millionaires um, and tells their story and through it tells the story of the economic story of black America, uh, how black America came out of slavery, came through slavery uh, and managed to establish itself and build, you know, many of you know, the great black cities of America, such as Atlanta, uh, such as uh, Memphis, and what we're going to talk about today uh, is Tulsa and Black Wall Street. Um, in particular, Tulsa and Oklahoma has a really important theme which dovetails with Juneteenth, because probably no, no more than more than any place on earth, Oklahoma uh, was almost a holy land for emancipated African Americans. Um, and I'll get into why, but African Americans used to colloquially re refer to Oklahoma, you know, in the um, uh, post uh, Civil War period uh, as the promised land. Uh, African Americans would talk about um, Oklahoma, you know, in, 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 in you know, almost dreamlike terms, that it was just, just this place where African Americans could be free, uh, they could own some land. Uh, they could be independent. And the reason for that is because Oklahoma was really the only place in the country that was not controlled by white people, so to speak. Uh, Oklahoma started out as a uh, basically a piece of the United States that was given to, Af given to uh, Native Americans. And give, that's probably the wrong term because they were really forced to go there, you know. Uh, Afri um, Native Americans were relocated from the Deep South uh, to Oklahoma on something we all know as the Trail of Tears. And, you know, after uh, the Civil War, it's a whole story to it that I'll get into, but basically there was a belief among African Americans that they could make a home in Oklahoma. And because it did not, it was not, so to speak, a territory controlled by white people or with this white heritage, um, that African Americans could go there uh, and they could make a life for themselves free from terrorism, free from lynching. They could be economically independent. Uh, and so they started to talk about it as the promised land. So even before the great migration that we know about, uh, we have a migration that actually took place to Oklahoma and a few other places. There's a group of Black migrants called the Exodusters. But basically, they went to um, you know, several places in the United States, but primarily for our purposes, Oklahoma, um, from the Deep South, thinking that they could escape sharecropping, they could escape racism, uh, they could be safe. Um, and so Oklahoma was really the first place African Americans uh, tried to make our own in this country after uh, slavery was ended. So I, I wanted to start out by reading you know, a excerpt from my book. It's a little long, so I apologize in advance. But it's called 40 Acres Deferred. And it basically is about the roots of Oklahoma and the roots of Tulsa um, and how it came to be for a period, a, a, a beacon of such hope and aspiration for African-Americans. So um, this is a excerpt from the book. It's called 40 Acres Deferred. Um, here I go. According to lore, on a hot day in June of 1865, at the end of the Civil War, a group of Union soldiers on horseback rode into Oklahoma from Texas and convened groups of enslaved African Americans in clearings in the woods and on plantation fields. In the thick, dust filled summer air, they told the gathering of African Americans that slavery was over. Oklahoma was vast full of frontier towns, farms, and Indian settlements. 
More than 5,000 African Americans lived in the territory in bondage. Despite what they may have been told, African Americans in Oklahoma would not be liberated until much later. They had been enslaved not by white men, but by the Indians of the Creek, Choctaw, Cherokee, Chickasaw, and Seminole tribes who ruled the region. The people of the five major tribes of Oklahoma fought with the Confederacy during the war and were slow to surrender to the Union, even after General Robert E. Lee and the rest of the Confederacy laid down their weapons. Stan Huwati, a Cherokee Confederate Brigadier General and commander of the Confederate Indian Cavalry was the last rebel commander to lay down his arms on June 23 of 1865. Even after that, the Indian rebels continued to fight for months. Braves raided Union camps in Oklahoma every few weeks and Indian slaveholders defied federal law and continued to hold African-Americans as slaves. Their resistance was born out of their attachment to the institution of slavery and their hatred of the United States government. Indians in the Southern states began enslaving African-Americans as early as the 18th century after they were introduced to the practice by white settlers. For some Indians, such as the Creek and Pawnee, holding sla slaves had been a part of their culture before contact with Europeans. For the majority, however, their entanglement in, with, with, with slavery began when they were the first victims of it. In the colonies of Georgia, Mississippi, Florida, and Alabama, Indians were held as slaves alongside African-Americans. Later, the, as the practice of enslaving Native Americans declined in the 1800s, members of the Creek, Choctaw, Cherokee, Seminole, and Chickasaw tribes began to show up at slave auctions to purchase trafficked African-Americans. As they shifted from pelt hunting to farming as their main source of income, plantation slavery became normal in Indian communities. In the 1830s and 1840s, Indians were displaced from the South by President Andrew Jackson's Indian Removal Act. Federal troops removed tens of thousands of Cherokee, Creek, Seminole, Chickasaw, and Choctaw Indians, forcing them to relocate to Oklahoma. They traveled on foot in stagecoaches or on the backs of horses across the Mississippi, taking their slaves with them into the wilderness. At the end of the journey, they reached an undeveloped patch of land that the government called the Indian Territory. The Native Americans translated the name into Choctaw and called it Oklahoma, meaning land of the red people. The, air, the area was also home to thousands of African Americans who made the journey as slaves. On the journey, migrants battled heat waves and hurricanes. They fought outbreaks of whooping cough, typhus, dysentery, and cholera, all while be, being given inadequate rations of food and water by the fellow troops who chaperoned their removal from their homelands. The African Americans who made the journey, sometimes in chains, were assigned to the bulk of manual labor and were often the last to receive a bite of food or a drink of water. As a result, they had the highest mortality rate on the trip known as the Trail of Tears. For the Indians and African Americans who survived the march, it would become to it would become to known it would come to be known in infamy as the Trail of Tears. Three decades later, when the Civil War began, the five tribes of Oklahoma pledged allegiance to the Confederacy. When the war ended, the terms of the Indians in Oklahoma, when, when the terms of the surrender of the Oklahoma Indians were announced at the end of the war, it brought jubilation and hope to African Americans who had been their slaves. Slowly at the end of 1865, more than 5,000 enslaved African Americans in the territory were set free. Upon emancipation, they ban began to advocate for the confiscated land uh, Indians surrendered to the Union Army to be broken up into 40 or 160 acre parcels and given to them to start farms. Some even dreamed that the ceded Indian territory could be turned into an all black state. All over the country, emancipated African Americans and their allies, the Union Army and the radical Republicans in Congress advocated for African Americans to be given 40 acres of land, perhaps with a mule and a plow. In Oklahoma, the realization of those hopes felt attainable. African Americans dreamed they could build a promised land on the old Indian lands, a place of their own where they could achieve economic independence as self employed farmers. In anticipation, hundreds of African American families took up residence on the Indian lands, living in shanty towns made up of old slave quarters and canvas tents. Almost as soon as they began squatting on the ceded Indian land, Bands of Choctaw and Chickasaw Indians with war paint smeared on their cheeks and carrying whips began riding into the encampments on random nights, raiding and pillaging homes. 
They looted and smashed and dragged black men out of their homes to publicly whip and lynch them as women and children watched. Despite those intimidations, the dreamers of Oklahoma remained, hoping that any day the government would give them the right to petition and be given land. In 1866, after the Indian tribes of Oklahoma finalized their surrender with a transfer of 5 million acres in the center of the Indian ter territory in Oklahoma to the federal government, African -Amer Americans began to petition the Bureau of Land Management for parcels of land. Under the Homestead Act passed by Abraham Lincoln, Americans could petition the government for allotments of land. Soon after the first inquiries were received, the Bureau of Land Management rejected them, announcing the lands had already been earmarked as a resettlement territory for a new group of displaced Indians who were being removed from the Midwest on a second trail of tears. Defeated, some African Americans stayed and fought to be accepted as tribesmen by Native Americans who had once held them as slaves. Others left Oklahoma altogether to find their way elsewhere in the emancipated world. There would be no 40 acres for them. There would be no promised land. Not yet. So I kind of wanted to read that excerpt uh, to kind of set up the um, history of Oklahoma and the history of Tulsa and how important this place was to African Americans going all the way back to emancipation. It was such a place of great hope. Um, and, you know, as, you know, as, as time went on, uh, and things got worse after emancipation. We, we had a brief period um, where African Americans, you know, enjoyed you know relative freedom, known as Reconstruction. Uh, but when the Reconstruction era began to decline and began to wane, and you started to have the Jim Crow era of lynching uh, and oppression come in, African Americans looked for some place to go, and more and more, that place became Oklahoma. Um, it was this place where, despite the, the, the complicated history with Native Americans, you know, there were no white men that they necessarily had to ha had to deal with. They didn't have this and the same the same culture, the same uh, obstacles as the Deep South. And so, all the way from the end of Civil War to the turn of the century, African Americans uh, came to Oklahoma. Um, and, you know, throughout the end of the 19th century, dozens and dozens of black towns were built in Oklahoma, specifically because of this mythology uh, around it, that it was the promised land, that it was free. Um, and so that kind of leads us to the formation of Tulsa in, in Black Wall Street. I'm not sure where we are in the slides, but um, I'll just keep, keep going. Um, Okay, so yeah, here we have a photo of gentlemen from Black Wall Street. Um, this is one of the most famous photos of uh, of um, of Black Wall Street and the businessmen that started it. So how how basically it came along is you had this mythology around black people in Oklahoma. You had black towns being built uh, in Oklahoma. Just a constant, uh, you know. Uh, constant migration to Oklahoma from other parts of the United States by, by Black Americans. So towards the end of the 19th century, uh, oil starts being discovered in Oklahoma. Um, and right at the turn of the century, you start to have big deposits of oil discovered in Oklahoma, 1901, 1902, 1905 was a big one. And so we know that, you know, uh, oil is Black gold. You know, and so this created a massive economic boom, and you started to have people move into Oklahoma uh, to mine the oil out of the ground, and so Oklahoma went from being a relatively undeveloped state without a lot of wealth to a rapidly developing state, the fastest growing state in the country, with a lot of wealth uh, from oil, and so the opportunity that came along with that was not necessarily to work in the oil fields as you would think most, in most cases, African-Americans were actually banned from working in the oil fields, unfortunately. But because the economy was growing so much, there was a tremendous need for other types of labor as these towns uh, kind of sprung up out of nowhere and became these boom towns uh, because of oil. 
Tulsa is what we're focused on here today. Uh, and it became one of the biggest boom towns in the West because of the, the, the discovery of evil. And so what happens is that you have a businessman, two businessmen, J.B. Stratford and O.W. Gurley. Um, they were living in nearby towns in Oklahoma. Uh, you know, they were already there, like a lot of African Americans. They had moved from nearby states, and they happen upon this undeveloped stretch of land that's on the north side of what today is Tulsa. Uh, so basically, you had what was then Tulsa um, on sort of the south side of a set of train tracks that kind of ran through what's Tulsa today, and that was the the rapidly developing town of Tulsa, which was mostly white. And O.W. Gurley and J.B. Stratford, they developed a town on the north side. And so they started building housing, hotels, storefronts, everything. And, you know, they finally created a place for African-Americans uh, of their own, a so-called promised land in Oklahoma. And so as African-Americans came to Tulsa to take jobs, they now had a bedroom community, so to speak, um, in Greenwood, where they could go. Uh, and in Tulsa, you know, the wages that were being paid to African Americans were incredibly high, uh, because Oklahoma was not a populous state. There was not a lot of labor there. And so, if you could get yourself to Oklahoma and just take a job as a courier or a maid or a chauffeur. You could make five times what you can make, 10 times what you can make in other states. So you had people there taking, you know, jobs in what was essentially the service economy a lot of times and making really good wages. Uh, and then what made Greenwood really special is that the people that worked on the other side of the train tracks, they would do everything else in Greenwood. So there were doctor's offices there, there were playhouses. Uh, restaurants, bars, and so the money stayed in the in the community of Greenwood. Um, and I think there's a perception that, you know, Greenwood was, you know, a, an extremely rich community, and it did have individuals like O.W. Gurley and J.B. Stratford, who were very wealthy, the founders of Black Wall Street. But this was mostly really a middle class neighborhood. But because it was so self-reliant and so tight-knit, the money stayed in the community and people were able to help each other um, in incredible ways. You know, you would have, you know, someone who is maybe a barber or a chauffeur in Greenwood who was maybe in neighbors or friends with someone who was a lawyer there. Um, and they would be neighbors, they would fraternize and maybe the lawyer would help the chauffeur's child go to college. Um, and you, so you had, you know, an incredibly high literacy rate in Greenwood. Um, you had an incredibly tight knit community um, on so many levels there. And it was really the unity and the economic independence of Greenwood. The fact that all their money stayed there that made it special. There is a, um, something called the Greenwood dollar. And it hasn't been exactly calculated, but money in Greenwood famously stayed within the community. And so the story goes that a dollar would circulate in Greenwood 23 times before it left the community. Now, I mean, depending on what st the statistics you look at, you know, your average black community, the dollar uh, is maybe turning over one, maybe two times within that community before it leaves. Um, so if you can imagine, 23 times, 20, 23 times of turning over. And every one of those transactions is a black owned business, is a black job. And you can imagine how prosperous the community became because of that. Um, could I have the next slide? So here's a little context of where we stand today in terms of black wealth and why it's important. I love to show this statistic because I think most people, when you ask them, what is the economic status of the black community, depending on how, uh, who you're asking, <laughs> they're gonna tell you that there's no middle class, 
everyone's in poverty um and that there's just you know there's no black people who basically are doing well economically and what the truth is is that we have these massive disparities and we have a lot of african americans who are still doing well um despite everything that's happening they're, they they're overcoming and you know that's what the spirit of this book is to kind of the book black fortunes that i wrote was that you know african americans have the dax stacked, stacked against them economically but that doesn't mean that we don't persevere and find ways to take care of ourselves take care of our people take care of our own community um so i just like to show this chart every now and then just for people to have that in their minds with the economic distribution looks like if i can have the next slide So these are some of the reasons why you do have some disparities in race, home ownership, uh, low rates of investment in securities, racial pay gaps, less inherited wealth. Uh, if I could have the next slide. This is the chart that I, I really like to show because when you contrast it with the first chart, which shows you that there are not these crazy massive differences in income in terms of what people earn, but this is the end the gaps in wealth are actually really really large um and wealth is not necessarily what you earn it's what you have what you own um so this is an interesting chart to contrast with the first one if i could have the next slide so i just want to go over the characters in in my book black fortunes um and who they were uh this is before i dive back into Greenwood in Oklahoma. This is what William Leidesdorf, as far as I can tell, he is the actual first black millionaire. He was a, um, he lived in, so he, was, he was born in the islands, but he lived in New Orleans, Louisiana, um, where he became a shipping merchant. His, um, his uh his so so basically williams latest or if i'm not you can if you you can check out his whole history in the book if you want but basically he was this guy that became the shipping merchant in new orleans during slavery and if you know anything about new orleans it's a polyglot everyone's there you know black people uh white people people from asia it's always been an incredibly diverse d diverse place so people didn't quite know what he was he was a you know fair-skinned african-american man um had he was known to have kind of sort of curly loosely curled hair with like a red tint to it um but he was this shipping merchant that did really well in new orleans and he got engaged to this woman as the story goes from he, she was a uh aristocrat in louisiana she actually had blood that went back to the french monarchy and uh, apparently she didn't know he was black he 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 had lied to her about it and they were to be married and uh he came out to her told her she was black her father got involved broke off the engagement and the story goes she died of a broken heart so william leaves he goes to california except this is california when it would still belong to mexico uh he goes to california starts a business out there as an importer expert exporter and merchant uh got involved in uh was a coffee merchant um and he became very friendly with the mexican government um and the mexican government ended up giving him a massive amount of land as a gift um and you know i wish i had a map to show this i wish i'd included this but basically if you look at sacramento <laughs> that's basically that was his land and so when uh, California became part of the United States, um, when we acquired it from Mexico, um, now he has this massive piece of land in the United States. And guess what? They discover gold there. It becomes an incredibly valuable piece of, piece of land. Uh, and this made him into a millionaire. He's a really interesting guy. He had a huge life as a diplomat and as just a business person. Uh, he really helped build up early California, but he died shortly after gold was discovered on his land and his family, uh, who was from the Caribbean, they were illiterate. They actually ended up being swindled out of the land. Uh, it's a very unfortunate story, but he's he's really interesting guy. Uh, if I could have the next slide. 
This is Mary Ellen Pleasant, another uh, Californian. Um, she was actually born in Massachusetts, but you know she's best known for California. Uh, she was born free during the slave era, era uh, in Massachusetts. Well, she was born in Pennsylvania, grew up in Massachusetts. And when she came to be an adult, um, she went to California during the gold rush. So she, as William Leidesdorf was passing away, Mary Ellen Pleasant was arriving and she had an inheritance from her husband and she invested it really shrewdly during the gold rush. Um, anybody who knows anything about the gold rush knows that the people that really made money were not the people that mined for gold. A lot of those people actually went broke. The people that made money uh, were people that sold things to the gold miners. Like we all know Levi's jeans, right? You know, Levi's was selling overalls <laughs> to gold miners. So and this is a massive company now. So uh, uh, along the, the, the same, the same uh, lines, Marianne Pleasant, she started laundromats which were big because you people had no way to wash their clothes. They had to actually send their shirts to China, if you can believe it. Uh, she started laundromats. She started a money laundering business because miners, they were boom or bust workers. They would either have a lot of money or be broke. So they always needed loans. Um, you know, and she actually started a boarding house and she had one of the nicest boarding houses in California. The governor of California actually lived in her boarding house. And she just became incredibly wealthy, became a millionaire, uh, also an activist. I mean, it's so hard to sum her up in this little snippet of time, but she's known for giving money to John Brown to help raid on, to help the, uh, fund the raid on Harper's Ferry. And then after um, the Civil War, she continued to be an activist, uh, continued to champion Black causes and women's causes in California. She integrated the streetcars there, which, fun fact, uh, Maya Angelou, was actually, I, I, I believe, the first black streetcar driver in San Francisco. So there is a connection between Mary Ellen Pleasant and Maya Angelou. But she integrated the streetcars. Uh, she advocated for women's divorce rights because women used to just get a horrible deal in divorce. Um, and, you know, just, you know, really advocated for black people and black causes. She's an amazing person. Uh, if I could have the next slide. This is Robert Reed Church. He was the first black millionaire in the South. Uh, he was born a slave in the Mississippi Delta. Uh, his father was the man that enslaved him. His mother was a, an enslaved seamstress. And um, she passed away when he was very young. So he actually went to live with his father on the riverboat where he actually worked. Uh, and so he learned a lot about entertainment because these riverboats, they were raucous. They had gambling, they had shows, they had music. And he basically grew up doing that, serving food, cooking food, uh, being a waiter, making drinks. And so um, when the Civil War broke out, um, his father has this big steam liner that goes up and down the Mississippi, entertaining people and also shipping cotton uh, was one of the main ways his father made money. And the Confederate comes and commandeers his father's ship with him on it. He, you know, he goes from being property of his father to property of, of the con Confederacy, if you can imagine it. Uh, during a big battle called the Battle of Memphis, he actually jumped off the ship, swam to freedom, um, built a life on, on Memphis as a, uh, basically an entertainment though in real estate were his main businesses. He started a pool hall which kind of expanded to a big dance hall or almost nightclub and he owned bars. And then he also got into commercial real estate, uh, making some shrewd investments, buying up real estate during a couple of the yellow fever pandemics. If I could have the next slide. This is Jeremiah Hamilton, uh, was mentioned by James in the intro, super interesting guy. He was a black Wall Street broker, uh, Back during the, the, the slavery period, he dueled with the Rockefellers. He was just an incredibly interesting guy. Uh, ruthless, ruthless investor. Uh, the Black Wolf Wall Street, if you will. Um, but, you know, I talked about him in my book particularly because there was a point where uh, there was an assassination attempt made on his life because uh, he was this rich Black guy and he was married to a white woman. And this is you know, during a period where black people are still enslaved and he's married to a white woman. So, you know, that of course brought some scrutiny to him and he's, they actually tried to kill him. And, you know, I, 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 
wanted to talk about the particular assassination attempt on his life because almost all of these folks, these early millionaires, had attempts made on their life um, because it was just, just that upsetting to people. If I could have the next slide. And here we go, O.W. Gurley and Black Wall Street. I love this picture because this is one of the only pictures of O.W. Gurley. If you see the guy kneeling down with the glasses, that's O.W. Gurley. Um, so O.W. Gurley, it's not clear whether he was born a slave or just after his birthday is in dispute, but he was right on the line between the um, emancipation, whether he was born, but his parents were both slaves. And he was born in Pine Bluff, Arkansas, incredibly industrious guy, uh, started, out, uh, started out as a teacher, then you got a job in the post office um, right after uh, the Civil War, which was really important because being in the, po the Postal Service was one of the first uh, federal agencies to integrate. So if you're a Black person and you wanted a federal job, especially during the Reconstruction period, the post office was it. He um, left that job, became a principal, opened a grocery store. And then when he heard about uh, oil being discovered near Tulsa, he went to Tulsa, uh, you know, saw that there was something happening there that was an opportunity. And he built Greenwood along with a similar individual he met, uh, John the Baptist Stratford. Um, but these are some of the other, these are the uh, architects, so to speak, of Black Wall Street. If I can have the next next slide. Annie Malone, she was CJ Walker's mentor. She was the first person to become a millionaire with a black hair company. Madam CJ Walker, who's a little more famous, is actually an employee of hers who kind of, um, you know, borrowed from her idea um, and, you know, started her own hair company. It became rivals later on. And if I can have the next one. Hannah Elias, this is a woman scandalous <laughs> but i um, she was born in philadelphia uh she's basically a socialite uh moved to new york got involved with this millionaire a uh, white millionaire in new york um he basically ended up falling in love with her giving her tons and tons of money and she which she invested in real estate uh she was one of the early investors in harlem and brought up a lot of the property in harlem it was very upsetting to people. Um, you know, her how there was a riot at her house at one point. She was involved in uh, the a murder of a high ranking of government official in New York. Uh, I, 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 you know, if you if you want to hear more about these folks, you can definitely check out in the book. Hannah Elias is talked about in the book, but she was a socialite who invested well, uh, basically, and became a millionaire in New York uh, in the early 1900s. Uh, if, can I have the next slide? Okay, and so this is a picture of the Trail of Tears. I think I, I really love this picture because you don't really see this often. If you see the enslaved person with the um, package on their back um, or the parcel on their back, you know, the Trail of Tears is such a huge tragedy for Native Americans. But one thing that we don't really talk about is that it was a tragedy also for the people that they enslaved um, who had to make the journey with them as slaves. Um, so I just I just wanted to put that picture in there to give you guys a visual. If I could have the next slide. And I hope you're noticing the guy with the white package on his back. These are some of the uh, Confederate Native American soldiers. If I can have the next slide. This is a, one of, this is er, what early black Oklahoma looked like, you know, um, and, you know, you can see these people, it looks like they've built this shelter with their hands, own hands, they built it themselves out of logs and canvas. Um, and it just speaks to me how badly people wanted to make a life there and how, how much people wanted Oklahoma to work. Uh, if I can have the next slide. Can I have the next one? So this is a drawing where you can kind of see a little bit, a sprawl of early uh, Tulsa. You know, I put this picture in here because most of the pictures of early Tulsa are from after it was rebuilt after the, the massacre, but I wanted to kind of give folks 
a, a sense of what it looked like. If I could have the next slide. And so this is a picture of Tulsa today. I thought I had a picture of the massacre in there, but um, we can go off this. So basically after um, Tulsa gets built up and becomes this prospering economic place where you have black people who are sending their kids to Ivy League colleges, if you can believe it. You have black doctors, black lawyers. Uh, you have an incredibly high literacy rate and then on top of that, the thing that was interesting about the, the, about the black folks in green was they were heavily armed. It's kind of the wild, wild west. Um, and they were, uh, you know, gun toting people, you know. And, you know, you can understand if a lot of these people came from places where they were escaping lynching, why they would want to own guns. And a lot of these people were traumatized. And so they were expecting the next violent thing to come towards them. And they weren't wrong because there was a, a, a tremendous amount of jealousy in you know, the white community in, 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 in Tulsa and Oklahoma about Greenwood and how prosperous it was becoming and how independent they were and how much swagger and confidence the people had over there and their kids, you know, someone in Tulsa sent their kid to Columbia, you know, I mean, in Greenwood, you know, and this is during the early 1900s. I mean, and it was just, a lot of tension, I'll put it that way. Um, and so we all know the story. Um, you know, essentially there was a black elevator operator who supposedly accosted a young white woman, still don't know the truth about what happened. She recanted and didn't recant and he was arrested. And basically the jailhouse where he was be being held became basically a, this, site of a confrontation. There were white folks there and wanted to lynch him. And there were black folks there from Greenwood who were like, oh no, you're not going to lynch him. And they were there with their firearms and they were ready to, to protect them. So, you know, this goes on for two days, this scene at the jailhouse in Tulsa. Um, and at one point a shot gets fired and, you know, it turns into um, basically an assault on the Black Tulsans. There was a group of armed, there was sort of an armed white group there that attacked the group. Uh, and then they got into their vehicles and they started riding into Tulsa, into Black Tulsa, into Greenwood, uh, firebombing the buildings, shooting people, killing people, burning buildings down. And this was the Tulsa, Tulsa massacre. Um, you know, and we're celebrating the, 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 the centennial of it. Put this picture just because I, I, I wanted to show what, what it looks like now. And it was rebuilt very soon after the massacre, which doesn't make up for what was done. Um, so much wealth was destroyed. So many businesses were destroyed. O.W. Gurley, the founder of Black Wall Street, moved to California. He just left. He, didn't, he, just, he was traumatized. Um, but it was rebuilt, but my question to you to think about, you know, maybe you regained Tulsa in, in a way, but I think you kind of lost the promised land, that concept of this place that African Americans could go where they could be prosperous and safe. The buildings, you know, in Tulsa, a lot of them were rebuilt, some of the businesses reopened, but you can never restore that sense of safety. Um, you know, that sense of refuge that African Americans had in, 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 in Tulsa, you know, and I think we're still looking for our promised land today, you know, and, you know, we fantasize about Wakanda, you know, and all these different things. But this was, you know, in a lot of ways, an independent, powerful Black community where people were not afraid. Um, and so I think it what, what was, was, obviously tragic that it was destroyed. But, you know, it's also interwoven with the story of Black folks coming out of enslavement and, you know, standing on their own two feet and gaining economic strength. Um, and, you know, what that meant from a, 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 a standpoint of independence, we're able to build our own institutions. You know, we still have these cities like Memphis and Jacksonville. Um, that were basically built by black entrepreneurs. But 
there was also a cost and a lot of people, you know, paid the price. So I think that's something to, to, to think about today. And I'll close with this picture of the folks dancing in, uh, in Greenwood. And I think that's important. You know, Greenwood was known for its joyousness. They used to have these street, street parties. Um, and, you know, basically in Greenwood, they didn't party in a club, they partied in the dirt, dirt roads in the street. And so everybody, when every, people had the day off, um, I believe it was usually Tuesday, most people had the day off in Greenwood. You would have bands and people pour out into the streets in Greenwood and they would just dance. They would just dance. And, you know, it was just described as one of the most joyous things you would ever see, just everybody pouring out of their houses in Greenwood into the streets and just, just dancing and shuffling along and having a good time uh, and smiling. So when I try to think of Greenwood to balance out the tragedy, the pain of it, you know, I think about people pouring out into the streets of, of, of Greenwood and just, just, just being joyous, you know, and hoping that, you know, in some instances, maybe we can recapture that feeling every once in a while. So I'll take questions if folks have them. Um, James, did you want to ask me the questions or do you want me to just go through the chat? Hi, Mr. Will, can you hear me? Can you hear me, Mr. Yes. Will? Yes. yes, we're actually going to take a quick three minute break. Um, and thank you so much for your wonderful presentation. We're going to take a quick three minute break, as I said earlier. Oh, no, no. And then I do have questions and um, after we come back from the break, okay? Okay, do you want me to, you stay logged on though, correct? Yes, yes. We will both stay logged on. We're, we will both just take a three, a, a quick three minute break. And can, okay. uh, can the technical support please cue the slides? Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Will. Your presentation was amazing. Oh, thank you, James. And thank you for the introduction. The introduction. Yes, sir. When the slide starts, we will begin the three minute break from the beginning. Thank you so much. We will now break.
All right, we are back. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, yes, Mr. Wills, before the break, uh, you asked me if I had some questions that I most certainly do. Um, not that many, but just a few. So my first question is, um, <clears throat> so many of the staff of the Dallas Public Library have the wonderful privilege of attending um, the annual Texas Library Association Conference um, that took place in April. And one of the featured speakers was Mrs. Ilyasa Shabazz, the daughter of Malcolm X. And she came to promote her latest book. Um, but I, she mentioned the reason that she writes multiple children's books about her parents and her grandparents is because the publications um, <clears throat> about Malcolm X were not accurate. And she felt it was important to control the narrative. And in reading, um, the introduction of your book, when you talk about your relative, John Drew, I was curious to know if you felt the same. Did you write, was the objective of this book to, con um, to control the narrative? I mean, not really, you know? I mean, there's not too much controversy with him. You know, he was, um, for folks who don't know, my great, great uncle, John Drew, was one of the first black millionaires in the Philadelphia area. Um, and, you know, he basically started a trolley company and invested the money in the stock market in the 19 teens and 1920s and pulled it out right before the crash. And he bought a Negro League baseball team. Uh, the only thing controversial about John, and I didn't get into this, is like him and the manager of the baseball team had like a horrible falling out, you know, um, and I think they had won the World Series before. So there's some baseball drama. I mean, if anybody wants to talk baseball. But I think he, you know, there, there was like, uh, you know, stuff about like pitchers and what the team was going to be named. But I mean, you know, I, he's not a well-known person. So I didn't really, you know, you know, I was glad to be able to mention him. But, it, it, you know, I don't think with John, it was really, you know, Uncle Johnny it was really about controlling a narrative with him. Um, that story still has to be written about the Negro League um, and what happened there. Um, but uh, I, I did feel like it's important that you had Black voices weigh in on some of these other folks, like Mary Ellen Pleasant and Robert Reed Church, specifically, who've only really been written about by whites, and especially in, in, in the, for the most part. I don't want to speak because I know there's some Black folks that have done work on these folks, and I don't want to take anything away from them. But the, 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 the publications about these folks that are heralded and lifted up are by white scholars, which is not, necess ne not necessarily anything wrong with that. But with Mary Ellen Pleasant in particular, there's a, a woman named Helen Holdridge who did the majority of the scholarship on her, who was an avowed racist, um, was a white supremacist. And, you know, she, the stuff she writes about her, Mary Ellen Pleasant is using the voodoo, you know, she's trading sex for, you know, all this horrible, horrible stuff. And you know that was out there, and this, this is not somebody current. This is this is like, you know, sixty years ago, seventy years ago. She wrote this, but it's still like referenced today. Um, and you know, with Robert Reed Church, a lot of people say he was a pimp. You know, because he owned basically he owned he owned the majority of the real estate on Bill Street in Memphis, and so any business was pretty much on Bill Street. He was your landlord whether it was a bar or whether it was a barber shop or it could have been a strip joint, you know, or it could have been a brothel, you know, but he wasn't, he never owned and operated any of these businesses. But what they love to do with Robert Reed Church is say, oh, well, he was a landlord to this guy who operated a brothel, you know, and so he, that makes him a pimp and he was, you know, a human trafficker. I'm not saying, you know, it's the greatest tenant to have is, you know, I'm not excusing that, but, to call him a human trafficker and a pimp and all this, is, it's it's extreme. And, and, and I do feel like sometimes stereotypes work their way in, you know, because to, to, to kind of explain away the excellence of some of these people. That Mary Ellen Pleasant couldn't have just been a genius, right? What W.E.B. W. Du Bois said about Mary Ellen Pleasant, he said, if she was a white man, she would have been president. She was a genius. 
right? She was this person who was, a, as a Black woman, was able to go to San Francisco, see where the investment opportunities were, you know, like, you know, a lot of folks did in San Francisco. A lot of those companies founded during the gold rush are still big companies today. I mentioned Leapbox, you know, or it became big during the gold rush. You know, she was a genius, but, you know, a lot of people say, oh, well, maybe she was sleeping with a white man who knew something and he told her, and that's how she knew. And she did have business partners, but, you know, they were, there's, in my opinion, those are legitimate business relationships. And then just say, well, she was having a, a relationship with this person and that's why she was able to do so well. It's, it's so, it's specious to me at best. So I think I really did want to, you know, try to write these people's stories with taking a lot of the folklore and stereotyping out of it. And that's not to say that I got everything right, but, uh, you know, I feel like with Black people that do incredible things, especially going further back, it's always like, oh, how do we explain this away? You know, what evil thing, what voodoo, literally, what voodoo were they doing to, 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 to be able to attain this? Um, Jeremiah Hamilton is another one. And, you know, he was a messed up guy, you know? I mean, he was, a lot of those early investors were ruthless. He was a ruthless guy, you know what I mean? But other folks who are ruthless investors on Wall Street, you know, they have buildings named after them, you know? And they called him the Prince of Darkness because of his ruthlessness and his skin tone. Um, so I just I just feel like it I I, I, I did I did, did feel like some of the 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 uh, research on these folks was one sided, and you know, I give the negatives. I show the problems that a lot of these people had. I showed them as tried to show them as full human beings with flaws, but I don't use their flaws to explain away their economic accomplishments because I fundamentally believe they're separate. Thank you so much for your response. You know, um, nobody is a saint, but you know, the, the the contributions are the contribution. They are, you know, the the work speaks for itself. My next question is um, along the same lines of controlling the narrative. Um, some of the events and people discussed in Black Fortunes have had movie um, and miniseries adaptations, such as Self Made on Netflix. Um, which is, it primarily focuses on Madam C.J. Walker. As I said earlier, when I was reviewing the book list, is the adaptation of um, the book that was written by Mrs. Alilia Bundle. Um, but it also featured Annie Turnbull. Um, and then as far as the Tulsa Massacre is concerned, um, Watchmen and Lovecraft Country um, are on HBO Max. Um, so my question to you is, have you seen these um, movies, miniseries, um, and if so, how accurate do you think these uh, uh, adaptations were of the events that they depict? I've seen uh, Watchmen. I haven't seen the other two. You know, I'm, I, but, you know, I haven't seen anything. <laughs> I haven't seen Tiger King or, you know, I've just been behind, a little behind on my TV watching during the pandemic. But um, I did see Watchmen. Um, and, you know, I thought it was super interesting and I love the fact that they were able to introduce that, the, the, the Tulsa massacre and Black Wall Street to an entire new audience of, you know, cause comic book movies are huge now. And, you know, I, I thought it was great that they were able to introduce that to folks. And I hope that that made folks go in and really want to learn uh, what went on. I, 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 you know, I don't think they, I mean, you know, I, I liked it, you know, I, I liked it. I, I, I think it hopefully will, will get folks more interested in the subject. Thank you so much. My next question, um, in the book, you, uh, in, in your presentation just now, you discussed how, you know, historical figures such as Mary Ellen Pleasant um, used her wealth to support causes that benefited the Black community, specifically, you know, giving money to John Brown. Um, while others like Jeremiah Hamilton have the reputation of the Prince of Darkness. Um, do you think that Black capitalism is necessary to achieve Black liberation or will it inevitably lead to assimilationism? Yeah, I think it's 100% necessary. And, you know, I, you know, I think that inclusion is important, you know, but 
you also have to have your own institutions. You know, I think it's important that black people can attend Ivy League schools. I went to an Ivy League school, but I'm glad that Morehouse exists. You know, I wouldn't be who I am today without an HBCU. You know, it's great that, oh, you know, I could later go on to one of these so-called elite institutions. I love Columbia. I'm not throwing any shade on it. I love that school. But I think it's important that we have our own institutions, you know, and that we have our own businesses. We, and that everything doesn't really fall along the lines of lobbying for inclusion, you know, because I think, you know, there's a story about how, um, you know, a lot of the funds that, you know, corporations promised during, you know, the, um, you know, when everything happened with George Floyd about how, you know, a lot of those funds have not actually been delivered, you know, and I, I think that relying on the social conscientiousness of other folks is, is not never a good idea, you know? And I think that's what Greenwood was about. You know, the people in Greenwood, they weren't adversarial to, to, to inclusion. Most of them worked for white people, you know? Uh, you know, O.W. Gurley to some controversy famously banked with a white bank, which, you know, I don't necessarily think was a great move on his part because it, if you read the book that you know, dimmed his reputation there. But, you know, Greenwood is a good, great, great example of you had all these black folks, a lot of them worked for white people, but then they also had these institutions back in Greenwood. So it was like everybody else, having a balance between inclusion and self-empowerment, I think is much, much healthier than just relying 100% on inclusion. That's, that's just my opinion. Thank you so much for your response. Can you clarify, um, because um, you said you didn't have the opportunity to um, watch Self Made, um, but I did. And one of the, there was a theme in, and, and of course, for those that haven't seen Self Made, Self Made is a mini series on Netflix that's in four, um, there's four one hour episodes. Okay. So one of the episodes, and I want to say it's the second or the third one, but I could be wrong. But there's a theme between Booker T. Washington and Madam C.J. Walker at the National Negro Business League convention, um, and they it, it's a <laughs> they don't see eye to eye. And can you clarify how Booker T. Washington felt about the hair care products market to Black people um, during his time? Because Madam C.J. Walker, many people have critic, uh, criticized her for starting the Black weave and wig industry. And that was never her, I don't, I don't believe that that was her intention. And then after you discuss that, can you um, give us, um, I don't know if you've been um, in, uh, aware of like the Crown Act, but can you um, possibly provide insight into what momentum there could be to, for that law to be passed? Um, can, you, can you give me a quick summary on the Crown Act? Is that, is this natural hair? The Crown Act basically says that um, employers and educators cannot discriminate against um, individuals who wear natural hair. Is is it is Cory Book? Is this is a federal law? Is this Cory Booker or? Well, I'm, we, I'm so there's, multiple, there's multiple. There's um, multiple legislation. I know here in Texas we have um, we have some legislation, um, but there's also federal that. Cory Booker's interest. So um, you can talk about whichever you know one because it's in multiple states throughout the country. So you can talk about whichever one you feel comfortable. Yeah, you know, I, I think that Booker T. Washington's, I, I haven't seen that scene, so I don't really want to, you know, without seeing it. Booker T. Washington's uh, feelings on the cosmetic industry and the hair industry, they evolved over time. Like he didn't like it at first. He thought it was a waste of time, that it was superficial, so on and so forth. I think when he saw that it was a potential um, business opportunity for black folks to gain employment, um, you know, have businesses, I think he really, really came around on it. Um, so, I mean, he, but he, he initially did think it was kind of superficial and shallow. Um, so yeah, that, that, you know, that's how he felt about it. But he did evolve, he did evolve. Um, 
you know, it's a complicated situation with him and, and, you know, hair and, you know, but that's a whole nother talk. But uh, as far as, you know, the Crown Act and natural hair, I think it's so important. Like when you go back to Annie Malone, one of the things that Annie Malone was she was the she's the great 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 grandmother of the natural hair movement. Um, if she was a huge advocate of black women wearing their natural their their hair natural, um, and she really pushed back on this concept of black women wanting to change their hair, not liking their hair, um, and I think she 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 pushed for 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 more natural styles and you know hair health because if the story of annie malone is basically that she before she got into like hair styling her first entry into the hair industry was dealing with baldness um or balding because a lot of black women the hair products for black women women right out in the reconstruction and right after the civil war period toxic horrible stuff and so black women were, you know, mostly made by white companies, you know, some made by black companies, but black women were using these products and they were going bald. And so Annie Malone first wanted to figure out how to cure baldness in black women, which was like an epidemic in like the 1880s, 1890s, early 1900s, like black women were losing their hair, you know, from these products. And so one of the first things she wanted to develop was a method for black women who had, you know, chemical burns from lye soaps, who had clogged pores from they goose fat. That was the number one thing they used to give to black women to style their hair, goose fat. They had these clogged pores from goose fat. Annie Malone wanted to give them um, a way to regrow their hair. And, you know, so her entire uh, method from the miracle hair grower, which was kind of to deal with the uh, chemical burns and from her shampoos to kind of declog the pores. It was all about having healthy hair. Um, and, you know, that's one of the things I love about Annie Malone because she was really, as I understand the natural hair movement, it's all about, you know, self acceptance and, you know, wellness. Uh, and she really, really, really pioneered that. And, you know, uh, the self-love that she she espoused, and it was just really, really powerful. Um, so I just wanted to add that little side note on Annie. And you know, I 100% support African Americans being having job protected ability to 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 wear their hair natural. Telling someone that they have to undergo, I mean, <laughs> y'all make me get political here, but I don't understand how people who think that you know, the government shouldn't make people take a vaccine, want to turn around and, and tell people that they have to go put chemical hair straighteners on their hair, you know, and you, you know what I mean? Like if you, you, you know what I mean? And I'm pro vaccine. I'm just saying there's a hypocrisy there. There's a hypo yes, hypocrisy sir. there, yes, sir. you know, that, you know, people, they, you, you know, the same people that want you to straighten your hair and all this other sort of stuff, they're the same ones that, you know, you can't tell them to do anything with their body, you know, so, you know, it's, it's a basic right. It's a basic right that, that people should be able to have their bodies and present their bodies, you know, as they naturally, naturally come, you know, I mean, and, you know, black hair, you know, it shouldn't be controversial any more than any other form of hair. You know, and if you say, well, your hair has to be straightened for you to work, that's white supremacy. I'm sorry. You know, I yes, mean, that, you know, why? I mean, I don't see much difference between telling someone that they have to lighten their skin. You know, I mean, natural, you're, you can't force somebody to go undergo chemical treatments to change their appearance. You know, I mean, just to have the opportunity to work. It's, it's I could go on for a while about that one. <laughs> yes, 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 sir. Yes, sir. Thank you for your response. And I will just say personally, so many um, various employers last year, you know, they had the black squares saying that they were committed to Black Lives Matter and racial equity. Well, if that's what you believe, then black employees, if you have them, should be able to wear their hair they want to. Me personally, I just went to the barbershop. 
But why did I go to the barber shop? Not because I was ashamed of my natural hair, because it's 100 degrees here in Dallas. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and I, I went to my barber shop. I think I look nice. But I also look nice with my hair and when I wear my hair um, more in the Afro in the fall yeah. and winter. Yeah. I live right. in Texas, it's hot. <laughs> so thank you so much for your response. Just two more questions and then we will open it up to the audience. Please start submitting your questions now because if you don't submit them now, we will be ending early. So submit your questions now, please. Thank you so much because I have only two questions. Okay. You discuss how Harlem became, in your book, how Harlem became predominantly Black. Um, and mostly this story is related to <laughs> the, the, the scandalous Miss Hannah uh, Elias. I mean, we already talked about that. <laughs> but um, can you talk about, because um, I've been to Harlem um, a few years ago, um, visiting a friend. And I witnessed, you know, I went to the Schomburg Center and the Studio Museum. And um, my friend was telling me about, you know, this new development and that new development. I mean, the Studio Museum is getting a new building, by the way. But um, can you discuss the impact of gentrification, all these new developments, Black people having Black parties and, and white, uh, white residents calling the police? I mean, can you talk about gentrification and how that relates to how that impacts Black wealth, especially in the aftermath of the 2008 recession? Thank you so much. Yeah, I mean, what's good? Harlem, Harlem is changing, you know, it's a, it's a transient neighborhood, you know, started out, you know, as basically farmland, and then it became mostly, you know, Eastern European, Italian and Jewish, and then African Americans came in. And now you have a lot of, um, you know, uh, Latin American folks, you know, um, Dominican, um, as well as, you know, Caucasian folks moving Moving up there, I mean, Harlem's always been 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 transient. That's one of the inter interesting things about Harlem. Um, and another interesting point is that you know where were black folks before they were in Harlem? Well, you know, a lot of them were in Greenwich Village, if you can believe it, which is a you know very you know affluent neighborhood in New York. And you know, black folks lived in downtown New York, and then you know had to move to Harlem and. You know, now it seems like folks are being moved out of Harlem. And I, you know, I'm from Washington, D.C. They call it Chocolate City, uh, where, where, you know, when I was growing up, you know, and now that city is certainly changing. And, you know, I don't think demographic change is, is, is necessarily uh, bad, you know, but I, I, I do think that we have a housing crisis and it's falling on Black people, particularly acutely. Um, if you look at the Black home ownership rate under the age of 40, it's under 20 percent. Um, and, you know, all of these Black neighborhoods, Black cities, real estate values are growing up, affluent people are moving in, uh, but it's no, not really any place for Black folks to live. Um, and a lot of Black folks are being forced out you know, in New York, a lot of folks that African Americans, working class folks, actually live in the Poconos, which is the mountains in Pennsylvania, have to commute all the way out from there. And so, I do think we have to address in a really meaningful way um, the housing shortage, which is falling on African Americans hardest. Um, and that needs to be addressed, not in an abstract way, like oh, maybe one day we want to do something, uh, you know, the home ownership rates for African Americans are falling to the pre civil rights levels. Um, and if I were to pick, you know, one issue to focus on to increase the wealth of African Americans, if I could just pick one issue, you got to do a black home ownership program, because I can get into the downstream economic policies that have caused housing to go up. But the, the the byproduct of you know million dollar apartments in Harlem and things like this is that African Americans are being forced into rent, uh, which means they don't have that investment, which is most people's top investment, which is their home, and it's just destroying the the the, the wealth 
of African Americans. It's the number one contributing factor to the declining wealth of African Americans in the wealth gap. Um, and you know, we we have to figure something out in this country. And you know, if I can if I can be honest with you, I think in the African American community, I think it's a generational problem um, because I think a lot of older African Americans don't really see how much of a problem it is because they benefited from the housing prices going up. And, you know, I talk to African Americans all the time, older African Americans, oh, my house is a million dollars now, this is so great, so on and so forth. But then, you know, their kids can't buy a house and start a family. So it's kind of, you know, it's, it's, it's a double-edged sword. And I think we have to start having these conversations within our community, like, hey, I'm glad you're Mr. Wills, I think you might have froze. Let's give him just a moment to see if you can reconnect. Bear with that. There we go. Hello, hello Mr. Wills, we lost you there. Could you please repeat your most recent sentence? Am I am I back? All I was saying is that I, I just think home ownership is a serious is a serious issue, and it's the number one contributor to the growing wealth disparity. And I think we got to figure it out, you know, because it's it's not enough to tell older black folks, well, your home price is going up a lot. You got to keep moving the ball forward, and you, you know what's what's the point of having an incredibly wealthy generation of black people? followed by a general, you know, the permanent uh, declining of wealth of African Americans. And I'm not blaming older black folks at all. It's not their fault. They didn't make the policies, but I think a lot of them just don't even know that it's going on. They just see that their housing price has gone up and they think that everything is great for everybody. And I, and I do think that's a, a conversation that we need to, we need to have, you know, within our own community, you know, the way this housing crisis has impacted us. And now just to add one more thing, unfortunately, I think a lot of African-American folks are set to lose their homes again, like they did in 2008, because African-Americans are disproportionately in uh, this mortgage forbearance pro program uh, that, the, uh, that the government has. And if they don't have a smooth exit from the mortgage forbearance program, uh, a lot of them are gonna lose their homes like 2008. So, you know, housing is, bigger issue, in my opinion, than most people think for African Americans. I, I mean, to your point, you know, I'll be transparent. I'm 31 and I live, I'm currently coming to you live from my apartment. Um, I have a wonderful apartment, but you know, one of these days I would like to buy a home. And I live right. in North Dallas, um, one of the more prestigious neighborhoods. It's a very wonderful neighborhood, but I also, uh, th there are homes there are multi-million dollar homes down the street from where I live. And somewhere in my near vicinity, the former president George Bush lived. So I would, <laughs> I don't want to live where, I mean, I don't expect to have what former president Bush has, obviously, but I would like to have some sort of home. So myself and many of my peers, 31, 35, 40, 45, when that's, when that's gonna happen. So I, I agree with your point. My last yeah, question, I mean, and that's, oh, yeah. I just want to add that, that is one of the things actually to connect back to the, the talk. It's one of the things that made Black folks go to Tulsa uh, and go to Oklahoma, the desire for home ownership, which wasn't necessarily possible in the South. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a long, long, uh, long um, you know, history to it. Yeah. So, my last question is actually combined with two questions from the chat. Great minds think alike. Because, so I'm gonna read it from my perspective, but they're asking the same thing. Considering the theft of funds in the Freedmen's Bank, which I, which I informed you all about in my slide, the destruction of Tulsa Black Wall Street, which I discussed, and then Mr. Wills discussed more in depth, amongst other Black business districts across the country, Tulsa was not the only wealthy Black business district. 
In 2023 will be the centennial of the Rosewood Massacre, amongst others. Considering all of this theft, do you believe reparations is owed to African Americans? If so, do you think it'll be more likely to come from the municipal government, an example of which is Evanston, Illinois, which happened a few months ago, or the federal government? I mean, it's, it's yeah, it's a question of how much. You know, it's not a question of if it's owed. And let me explain that to you. Um, so there's part of it that the federal government is directly responsible for. Um, the Treasury Department collected taxes on slaves. Um, you know, I have, if you Google me, I wrote a whole a long article on reparations that goes into this. But the Treasury Department collected taxes on slaves. You know, I don't understand why that money cannot be returned as reparations. It wouldn't be a lot of money but it, 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 it would be morally, what's the argument for not returning it? Uh, then you go to you know the redlining policy. Then you go to the way, you know, you, you know uh, eminent domain was used to take land from black people to build highways and prisons and things like this. And how the urban planning of the United States was done in a deliberate way, often to, 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 to harm black neighborhoods. And before you get to the stolen wages, which is the big part, there are things that the federal government did that they should 100% pay reparations for. They should 100% yes, pay sir. reparations for running highways through black neighborhoods. Yes, sir. They should 100% pay reparations for the taxes they they collected on slaves they should they should just make that right now if you talk about the stolen wages um which is going to be the biggest piece of the pie in reparations i think there's a compelling argument for that as well uh because the united states benefited we became you know this massive wealthy country because of slavery and you know we you know we went from just another former British colony to ruling the world, you know, and, you know, I don't know, 120, 130 years. Um, so I think there's a very strong argument for that. But I think at very least, the way in which the federal government has acted to collect money based on black lives or, and, and, and harm black people um, through their policies I, I don't understand what the argument for not returning that money is. And I think there's a very compelling argument for paying restitution. Um, yeah. But I mean, the treasury should be sending out checks for the slave taxes to, you know, to the descendants of slaves. I just don't understand why that can't be done. Thank you for your response, Mr. Will. Um, we have a question from the chat. Um, participants saying, I'm looking forward to reading this book very much. What are you working on now, if you can share? And who are your top two Black fiction writers? And besides yourself, who are your top two nonfiction writers? Well, my top fiction writers, are you, do they have to be, are we talking about living or, or, or uh, all time? They can specify, let's go with all time. <laughs> all time, I think my, my favorite fiction writers, oh my goodness, I'd say, I say, I'll start with nonfiction because I gotta narrow it down. So yes, nonfiction sir. would definitely be uh, James Baldwin is yes, definitely my number one. And number two, whew, I would have to say, I wanna say Zora Neale Hurston, but I don't know whether the classifier is fiction or nonfiction. Um, so uh, I'd say Zora Neale Hurston, um, but I love her fiction work as well. Uh, fiction was that so that was my non that was my fiction nonfiction. So for fiction, I would have to say um, I don't know. So I don't know if I can include a playwright. <laughs> so I was going to say can. August Wilson, yeah. but uh, you know, so I say I'll say August. And also Octavia Butler. Yes, sir. Yeah. I'm a science, I love her science fiction. Um, 
now I'm just working on a book similar to this. It's a uh, it's about Black First. I can't. I'm. I haven't, it hasn't been announced yet, so I don't want to get too into it. Um, and then a young adult book, and you know, and then we are work, working on uh, a television adaption of the book with um, Stephanie Elaine, who did uh, Dear White People and uh, Boys in the Hood and a bunch of things. She's a Black Hollywood legend. Uh, I was just so honored to be working with her. So that's that's what we're working on now. Thank you so much for your response. Um, you know, I have two fun facts. Since your um, one of your favorite nonfiction was Zora Neale Hurston in 2019, um, the the last time that we've ever did the Juneteenth in person because of COVID, uh, the featured speaker was Dr. Deborah Plant, who edited mm -hmm. Barracoon, which was originally written by uh, Zora Bill Hurston. Uh, it was locked in those vaults for all those years. And so it was a, it was such a wonderful event back in 2019. Um, so that's just, yeah, you reminded me, you said that you reminded me of Juneteenth 2019. And another fun fact, since you mentioned Octavia Butler, the Mars, um, <laughs> I read sci-fi as well, and I keep up with, science, um, you know, I just don't focus on black culture. I focus, you know, I'm interested in space exploration. The Mars, mm -hmm. um, I believe it's the Perseverance rover that just landed. When they touch down, they claim the site on Mars that um, where the Perseverance rover landed, they called it Octavia Butler Land. Oh my and goodness, they, I didn't know that. Yes, sir. Please, I mean. Incredible. If you want to fact check me, um, if anyone wants to fact check me, you can go to www.nasa.gov. But they called it, they have it Octavia Butler Landing. Um, and they have, because what they, because what they do in NASA is, whether it's the moon or Mars or Titan is, a lot of it, of course, is Greco-Roman, you know, the legacy of white supremacy. But also it, um, they name it after, you know, science fiction uh, authors or, you know, or scientists. So. There are, there are sites on the moon and Mars and Titan, which is one of the, the largest moons of Saturn, that are named after those different people. So I thought I would share that fun fact. Um, That's amazing. Can I give, oh, speaking of fact check, can I say one thing? Because somebody, I misspoke and I said that Dick Rowling was the elevator operator and Sarah was the elevator operator. Dick Rowling was actually a shoe shine person slash doorman. So I thank you to the person that pointed out that little slip of the tongue. So I did want to correct that. Yes, and I believe, if I'm not mistaken, the person that corrected, um, that um, can clarify um, was Ms. Emma Rogers, who was the founder um, of Black Images Book Bazaar, which is, um, it's no longer an operation, but it was, um, it served the literacy needs of the Black community here in Dallas for many years. I remember, I, I wow. went there when I was a kid. So <laughs> wow. does anyone else remember going wow. back in the day? <laughs> it was over there off of Wingwood Village. Correct me if I'm wrong. Correct me if I'm wrong. Was it not at Wingwood Village? So, yeah, the wonderful Miss Emma Rogers, who was also in attendance at Juneteenth 2018. She was the she was our well, thank you, Emma. Thank, thank you. Yes, we have to support our black owned bookstores. Um, does anyone else have any more questions? Now, now is the time. We will know. We will not. This this present this program will not um, go after four p.m. So, if anyone has any more questions, now is the time. Um, while I'm waiting for some more questions, um, I, I want to say just one more, just quick question I have. Have any of the residences of the people um, featured in the book, have they been preserved or are they all destroyed? Because I, I, I thought that Madam C.J. Walker's mansion in New York was preserved. Correct me. Yeah, that, that's, 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 that's preserved. Um, yeah, I mean, so Hannah Elias's house still exists, but I don't think it's not like a historical site um, in New York. It's just both uh, the apartment she lived in in Harlem, I've actually gone there and you know looked up at the apartment she lived on the top floor. That's still there, and um, her mansion um, off of Central Park is still there, but it's not like marked as like a historical thing. It's just somebody's living there. Um, I believe Robert e Robert Reed Church's house 
is not still standing. I could be wrong on that though. Um, I'm going from memory. Um, trying to think. Alonzo Herndon, who's in the book, he's not really a major character, but he was the first black millionaire in Atlanta. His house is still standing and you can go on tours and see the whole thing. It's wonderful. Uh, the person that inspired this book, uh, the first black millionaire in Jamaica, um, William Stabile, he, uh, black, first black millionaire in Jamaica, was a carpenter on a ship in the 1840s. Ship wrecked off the coast of Venezuela. He swam to shore and found a gold mine, took over the gold mine, became a millionaire. I visited his house in Jamaica and that's what made me want to write this book. But that's still there in Kingston. It's called Devon House. Um, there's a famous ice cream shop on the site, but definitely go to see the mansion. It's much better than the ice cream. It's in Kingston. Um, that's still standing. Um, yeah, I'm trying to I'm trying to think. Mary Ellen Pleasant, ha Mary Ellen Pleasant's summer home in the Sonoma Valley in wine country still exists. It's part of a vineyard now, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. So yeah, I have to put that put that out, you know, as to put some information out for people that want to visit these people's homes, the ones that are still standing. Um, so it, thank you for bringing that up. Yes, because I bring it up because, you know, COVID won't be around forever. And so eventually, right. you know, tur tourism will return. And these, these are tourist attractions. I mean, um, I I visited um, Frederick Douglass's residence in Washington, D.C., wonderful. Um, I And on my list, my to-do list is to go to Harriet Tubman's um, National Park. Um, she has two national parks. One is in Maryland which is where she was enslaved. And the other is in New York where her residence, her final residence and her elder home that she created. Um, and I also believe the church that she attended. So <laughs> one of these days I'm, I'm making my way up to Auburn, New York. That's um, when, COVID, when COVID is over. So. Hopefully, yeah. Um, okay. Does another participant have a question? Um, they asked, did you consult with any of the survivors of the Greenwood Massacre? How many, are there, are, are there three survivors? How many of the survivors are there? No, I didn't get to talk to any of those folks. Um, you know, unfortunately, I was more focusing on um, the founders, um, specifically O.W. Gurley. Um, and he unfortunately didn't have any children, um, so I wasn't able to talk to any of his uh, direct descendants. But the um, the records from the Greenwood trials were really, really useful, and you know they you know left short biographical sketches behind. So, but I would love to talk to some of the Greenwood survivors. You know, I, I would love. I I didn't. I'm not sure how many are are still with us, but it would be an honor. Um, Emma Rogers is saying, and I and I obviously trust Emma Rogers. She's saying three. Ms. Wow. Rogers, do you know their names? Can you type that in the chat, please? So I can read the names for the recording, please. If you're aware. If you're not, it's fine. Other participants can submit questions. We have a couple, a few minutes left. Do you want me to read from the chat or? about definitely uh definitely uh you can suggest it you know you can definitely suggest it and you know i, hope, I would love especially since it's in paperback now and it's less expensive i would love for as many kids to read about this as possible thank you um miss miss rogers responded to my request um the, the names are hughes van ellis lefty benningfield randall uh hughes van ellis 
Leslie Benningfield Randall and Viola Fletcher. Those are the three survivors because everyone wants to act like things that have happened in this country is ancient history, but they're alive. I'll read the names again. One is Hughes Van Ellis, Leslie Benningfield Randall, and Viola Fletcher. And Ms. Emma Rogers is saying that Viola Fletcher is 107, the young wow. age of 107. Wow. The other two are 106. Is that ancient history? They're alive. Wow. Submit more questions. You have five minutes. You have five minutes. Going once. Going twice. Gone. Mr. Wills, thank you so much for your time. Uh, closing thoughts, social media contact is, is whatever you feel comfortable. Yeah, you can follow me on Twitter at, oops, just bought my computer, at uh, show Wills, S H O W I L L S, at, uh, not at anything, at Show Wills on Twitter, S H O W I L L S. Um, yeah, you know, closing thoughts, you know, I think as we think about Juneteenth and, and, and what it means, you know, I, I, I you know, the thing I, I like folks to really leave with when they think about Greenwood is to not just think about what happened there, but what it meant and put it in the greater context of everything that it that, that led up to it that oklahoma was a place that black people dreamed of you know for 60 70 years you know this is going to be it this wasn't a slave state or a white slave state or, or a, you know this was a state controlled by people of color and you know, they were going to be able to go there and make something for, you know, for themselves. And if you get read into the book, if you read the book, I talk about the other little towns that were founded in Oklahoma that didn't make it, you know, and there was actually a push to make uh, Oklahoma an all black state um, that didn't go through. And it was just, you think about like what that meant, you know, for this thing that we have been working for for 60, 70 years that the shining city of Oklahoma, in Oklahoma, Tulsa, Greenwood, the realization of this black dream, the place they call the promised land. You look at the names of the businesses in, in Greenwood, it's places like dreamland, you know? There's almost a dreamlike quality to it if you read about it. And what it meant for that to be destroyed. And, you know, if, if there's any way to reclaim that dream, you know, and, you know, I think about that all the time, you know, and that should probably be what I would leave you with. Thank you so much for your closing thoughts. I have a few closing thoughts of my own. Um, I am glad that Juneteenth is now a federal holiday because I, in my opinion, it provides an opportunity for the black community to have annual um, events or whatever we decide to do in which we just we can discuss how um, the local, state, and federal government can be held accountable for the violence and the psychological trauma they've caused on the Black community. 250 years of slavery, 100 years of Jim Crow, and 50 years of police terrorism. And we all know what happened last year. So, and I am I'm personally a part of a, a network of. Um, BIPOC librarians, because unfortunately, 90% um, <laughs> of librarians in the United States are white, surprise. Um, the other 10% are Black, Indigenous, Native, uh, Black, Indigenous, or Native American, Latinx, Asian, Arab. And, and, one of our, and we, we discuss a lot of things about racial equity. And one of the, um, uh, particip one of the members said that this country is a crime scene covered in the blood of BIPOC people. And when they said that, at first I'm like, uh, I was, it kind of took me off, <laughs> it took me off guard. But the more I thought about it, I'm like, yeah, 
They're right. This, this whole country is a crime scene. And until we can acknowledge, until the local, local state and federal governments are held accountable for their, the harm that they've caused, it will continue to be a crime scene. I'm glad that Juneteenth is a federal holiday. It's amazing. We work so, I mean, so many people have worked so hard to make that happen. But until we have reparations <laughs> and until uh, Black people are no longer convicted for a drug possession that white people are convicted for, this country will, and, and until you stop killing Native Americans and you know, Latinx people, and now you're killing East Asian people, <laughs> until you stop doing that, this country is a crime scene. So it might not be the truth, but it's my truth. So those are my uh, closing thoughts. I would like to, again, thank you all for coming. Uh, I would like to thank the friends of the Dallas Public Library for their generous support. They are amazing. Um, thank you again, Mr. Shamari Wills, for your time, for writing such a fascinating book, an informative presentation. And we will be sending an email to all registrants with the link to the recording, um, the book list. And we have a survey. We value your feedback. We do value your feedback. So please look for that within the next um, few weeks or so. We'll be sending that out. Thank you so much for visiting the Dallas Public Library online. You all have a wonderful, bright day. It, it's hot, but the sun is out. And happy Juneteenth. Thank you all so much. Thank you all.